Greetings adventurers, this is Lorne, your guild advisor, and welcome to my review of Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon, Volume 18, or the easier way of saying it, Damachi, Volume 18. And it's been about a year and a half since Volume 17 release, we had a slight delay when the original release date was in December. Go a month later in, it's January, here we are, finally the conclusion of the Freya arc. And what a conclusion it is, and it's... It's a thick one. This is a thick boy. <laughs> a thick novel indeed. The longest novel in the entire series so far. When the previous one was volume 14, but over there, about 20 pages more or less, uh, depending on the edition you have, either the digital or physical edition. So first, we're just going to go into my basic impressions on the novel itself. We're not going to go too long on that because I doubt many people are going into this review uh, wanting to make a decision on whether or not they're going to buy the book or not because we're already 17 volumes in. This is the 18th novel, the conclusion to the current arc. It makes no sense for you to like watch this video and go, hey, should I buy this book? Like, I think you already made your decision uh, when you read up to volume 17. So general impressions first, and then we're just going to have a gigantic, <laughs> enormous uh, spoiler discussion section because, again... This novel, a thick boy. So as always, these light novels are written by Fujino Omori Sensei, illustrated by Suzuhito Yasuda, and this novel is translated by Dale De Lucia. And of course, this is all done under the Yen On imprint under the publisher Yen Press. Once again, this is the longest novel in the entire series. And at some points, it certainly did feel that way. One thing I really liked in this novel is that we get to see a ton of different characters throughout the Damachi series uh, all have some part in this novel, whether that be like as a spectator, helping the Familia itself, helping Hestia Familia, or be a part of the coalition. Though at the same time, because there are so many characters, uh, a lot of them don't really get too much time at all or some are just kind of rolled over uh, in the story itself. And I will get a bit more into that in the spoiler discussion. And I mentioned the length of the novel already, but at some points in this novel, it really does feel like the story is kind of dragging on until it gets to a certain point. But after that turning point, the novel is, is very, very exciting to go through. Like you just can't get your eyes off the pages. Uh, but like the, the build up to that is, uh, <laughs> It's quite arduous. Uh, it really does feel like it's dragging at times before we get to that turning point. In general, Amori Sensei's fights are just really well written, and that's no different here. Like, there are a lot of cool fights between the characters, uh, com really cool combinations of characters working together, and also some really cool, clever use of tactics, some new, like, skill reveals, new magic reveals. Those are all really exciting. Uh, it's kind of nuts to think about this being animated in Season 5. Uh, the animators are going to have to like work overtime. I really hope they take their time on the anime. But yes, like the, the fights in this novel are a masterpiece. Now, as for the resolution of the story in this novel, it's not really a surprise. This is Damachi. We know that Bell is always going to end up winning somehow. The important part is just how we get to that point, how it happens. Is it believable? Is it emotional? All that kind of stuff. But again, how the story ends isn't really a surprise, but there are some cool revelations and reveals uh, in terms of the world building uh, towards the beginning of the novel. And also just in general, like the, the reveals about certain characters and uh, relationships that are <laughs> going to be uh, uh, further developed uh, as we get further and further into the series itself. And uh, I, for one, am just kind of happy that this arc is over, not to say that it was a bad arc, but... Uh, the novels, it's been a slow ride to getting these novels because I think, what, the Freya arc from volume 16 through 18, it's taken like two and a half years to get through this, so I'm ready for, for a new part to the story. And it certainly does seem like Amori Sensei is focusing towards the end of the story because we do get a lot of mentions uh, about the Great Quest and the Black Dragon in this novel. So with those general impressions out of the way, we can get into the meat of the story itself. I'm just going to be going over like a bunch of the story points, uh, things that I wanted to highlight that happened in the story. I might have missed some things, so feel free to discuss 
whatever you want about the story itself in the comments. Just a side note, I don't want anything about volume 19 in the comments itself. Uh, you can speculate on what it's going to be about, but since volume 19 is out in Japan, I don't want anyone like spoiling people about what happens in volume 19. Uh, this is not the video for that type of discussion. There are other avenues for that. There are some people that have gone ahead and read some of the translated summaries of what happens in volume 19. But again, I don't want any of that in this video comment section, just stuff solely related to volume 18 and speculations that can come from that, but nothing uh, that spoils the novels that have released after volume 18. Thank you. So the novel starts with Freya, or Seer's perspective, and of course Omori Sensei like constantly has to remind us of like other goddesses. He loves mentioning them. Uh, he mentions Artemis, Aphrodite, <laughs> like even though these are goddesses that have technically only appeared in non-canon material, being the Era the Orion movie and the Aedis Vesta events from the mobile game Don Memo, uh, that, that would be Artemis and Aphrodite. Uh, he is constantly reminding us that these goddesses do exist in the universe, just not necessarily those specific versions that are from the movie and the game. But again, Artemis and Aphrodite do exist. And we also got uh, mentions of Odin and another goddess called Idun or Idun, well, however you pronounce that name. So it's cool seeing other gods and goddesses mentioned in the novel. And we also get the imagery of uh, Freya or Seer as a girl in this field of flowers and that immediately brings to mind the imagery you saw when they announced uh, season five of the anime because that is indeed the image of uh, Freya Seer in a field of flowers and in that art she's also holding a purple flower I wonder what, what that's a reference to <laughs> but yes yeah, so it does definitely seems like the uh, anime adaptation of season five will definitely be adapting up to volume 18 which makes total sense because that would be the entire Freya arc it makes sense to adapt it all at once so whatever season five whenever it comes out it's going to definitely cover the Freya arc volume 16 through 18 and probably involve elements of 15 as well but again, it's cool to see that the imagery that we get in the novels here are the inspiration for the key art uh, that announced season five of the anime. So looking forward to the adaption whenever it comes out. It's definitely going to need uh, at least two cores, uh, just like season four got, because again, the Freya arc is much longer in page count than uh what season four covered with volumes 12 through 14. and then moving forward we get our first appearance of ryu <laughs> of course i'm very excited because she's my favorite character though uh, her screen time uh <laughs> is pretty much this for the first half of the novel it's this part right here where she's going off to finally visit Estrella and get her status updated after five whole years and some interesting details about ryu uh in this part of the story specifically they mentioned that her hair is getting longer uh, it's actually showing her original hair color which is a, a pure blonde and not the uh, dyed green hair that she gets uh, from seer and she's going to zolongram the city of swordsmiths where Estrella is and uh, the interesting thing about this is that um episode ryu volume 2 is a novel that released uh, in japan last october and in episode Ryu Volume 2, it actually details uh, Ryu's visit uh, to Estrella in that novel. So I'm excited to see or whenever that translation for that novel comes out. It probably will be a while because there's a huge backlog of other novels to go through. Uh, but apparently, originally, uh, that part of the story was supposed to be in this novel. But then uh, the editors were like, Amori Sensei, this, this book is long enough. <laughs> It's over 400 pages long, and I think there's actually a hard limit uh, to how long a light novel can be because uh, of the limitations of uh, how they how they print these novels. So even if Amori Sensei wanted to include it, he wouldn't be able to uh, without making some cuts. So I'm glad that uh, that story isn't really being cut, but rather expanded into its own volume in Episode Ryu Volume 2. But because of that, uh, the, the pacing's kind of a bit weird because again this is Ryu's only appearance in the first half of the book until she comes back for the turning point and it just it's a really strange absence uh, to be honest because it's like okay we're 
where is she? <laughs> She's definitely going to appear at some point, and uh, it takes uh, about half the novel to get through before she appears again. But uh, also, if you look at episode review volume two, the back of the book has her status update, uh, which is probably interesting for people that uh, read this book because she got a freaking double level up to level six. So seeing that status page is interesting, but also has an illustration of her uh, with her longer hair and also tied into a ponytail. So that's cool to take a look at as well. And throughout all these war game preparations, we got a bunch of details regarding the fact that Loki Familia cannot participate in the war game, which makes a lot of sense given, uh, like they said in the novel, uh, if Loki Familia were to participate in this war game, it would basically just be like Loki Familia versus Freya Familia and not uh, the challenger Hestia Familia going against Freya Familia. So that makes a lot of sense to me, and of course, again, it would pretty much be a sort of Oratoria novel at a certain point if it was Loki versus Freya Familia, because basically what would happen is like a bunch of the Loki Familia members would match up against the Freya Familia members, and the novel probably would not be as interesting as a as it is uh, with the way it is currently written. And we got some cool information reveals because of that. For example. Finn's conversation with Royman, the head of the guild. Uh, Royman is bribing Finn uh, with information about something in the dungeon called Thalia's Ice Garden. And this is a section of the dungeon that's between floors 60 and 61. And if you remember, or if you've read Sword Oratoria, you'll know that at Sword Oratoria Volume 4, Loki Familia made it to floor 59, where they defeated the demi spirit that was there. And uh, we, they haven't really gone on the expedition since then. So very interesting detail about the Thalia Ice Garden. And apparently, I, I believe even Zeus and Hera Familia couldn't find the key to get into there. So that's a very interesting detail as well. And uh, Finn mentions like, like her in quotation marks or uh, italicized, I guess. I believe her is a reference to the Empress. Uh, the Empress being the level 9 female adventurer from Hera Familia. So this detail on the Ice Garden is really interesting in terms of world building, and it makes you wonder uh, what's next for the future installments of Sword Oratoria, now that Finn is going to have access to this information about that area of the dungeon. So Bell finally gets his status updated. Naturally, he has a ton of triple S's in there before finally becoming level five, and he gets a new skill called Rapid Strikes. And uh, we really do see it uh, in motion uh, towards the finale of the novel itself and that was a really cool moment and he also gets a new unique skill called vanidus v venery veneers something like that <laughs> and there's a bunch of aspects to that skill uh one on the status page is called hestia de Ve. i don't think it's quite explained what that part of the skill is but we also see that if charm is applied on bell all his stats get increased uh, that, that's kind of confusing since uh, one side effect of Liara's Freze is supposed to be that Bell is immune to charm. So I guess that if you attempt to charm Bell, his stats will increase, which makes for some interesting uh, ideas. Like, does that mean that in the future, if Bell needs a quick stat boost, that like M Mari, the mermaid Zenos, can sing a song and <laughs> Bell's immune to charm, but it is a form of charm and his stats will increase. Does it mean that in the future, uh, Seer slash Freya can try to use her charm and that will make Bell's stats increase? I don't know. And then the last part of that is a continuous uh, mind and stamina regen. And I don't think that was really used in this novel. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This was a long novel and it, it seemed like Bell was getting the crap <laughs> kicked out of him by Otaro a lot. And that regen skill didn't seem to do anything in that regard. But maybe it did and that's why Bell was able to stay alive. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more about how those skills are used uh, later on in the series. I mean, we finally got a use for the escape skill. <laughs> Uh, at the end of this novel. That's very interesting to talk about, but we'll get to that later. We have Finn going to the Hestia Familia home to coach Lily on tactics and being a commander. And uh, if you guys saw like the illustration art for the chapter, it has like Bell and Hestia, uh, presumably looking at the status update sheet and it has uh, that quote, like we'll get married 
uh, after this is over or something like that. At first, I thought that was like a, a joke between Bell and Hestia, uh, but then that was ne like never mentioned in the in the novel in that chapter. And then like, is it a reference to to Freya because she's basically like in this white, almost bridal like dress uh, during the war game? So she's hoping that she'll win and then marry Bell. And then I had this funny idea in my head how. Finn proposed to Lily once, like maybe, maybe it's a reference to that. And because Tiona and Tiona were coming to help train Bell, I was kind of hoping that we'd see like a little scene of Tiona like walking in on Finn, uh, coaching Lily and, and her getting jealous. But I guess we didn't get that scene. One small detail I thought was interesting is that we see that Aisha is officially a, a member of Plutus Familia on paper, and I'm assuming that. A lot of the Amazons from Ishtar Familia uh, converted into Plutus Familia, and that's why you see like Lena and Samara uh, still be able to fight in the war game, even though there were four Familias left at a certain point. And one of those was Plutus Familia, so I guess most of those Amazons are in Plutus Familia now. It's also mentioned that Eyes has her own obligations, her own oaths uh, regarding like the war game, and she can't even like intervene or assist in any way uh, in regards to the war game. That means even trading Bell because of her promise to Freya. And that's a promise that was made in the Sword of Retoria series. So if you had not read the Sword of Retoria series, that's where that promise comes from. Uh, that's from uh, when Freya let Otaro train eyes in preparation for a battle that happens in Sword of Retoria. So again, uh, you should definitely check out Sword of Retoria <laughs> if you haven't been reading it, uh, especially uh, because of these long waits between the main novels. Then we get that cool flashback with Freya Seer in that field of flowers and she's crying. And that's her first meeting with Mia. And she tries to like charm Mia. And of course, Mia being Mia doesn't give a crap. Punches Freya the goddess in the face. Mia's incredible. <laughs> Just not giving a crap. And, and, and Freya is taken aback by it. It's like, whoa, someone punched me. That's awesome! <laughs> be, my, be my Freya Familia member, please, Mia. So that was a fun little moment. A cool little sweet moment, uh, ironic as it is, with uh, Mia punching her. So, uh, Ryu, you can go ahead and slap Freya, because Mia... <laughs> that seems like a minor thing compared to a Mia punch. Then we're just going to skip ahead to right before the war game begins. We have, like, all the Familias get together that are part of the Hestia Familia Coalition. And uh, it's really cool to see Naza participating this time because she wasn't an uh, active participant in the uh, Apollo War game, but she's here for this one. Like, uh, there's no monsters to activate her PTSD because she's just going against living people. Uh, though well, one could argue that Ataro becomes uh, like a monster towards the end of this novel, but uh, again, Cool to see Naza do some stuff here. It's also funny that Take is wondering, uh, with him being the, the martial arts god, if he can actually fight people. And they're like, well, uh, as long as it's not too outlandish, I guess. And uh, he ends up taking out quite a bit of few people uh, before his flower is taken. So that, that's also really cool to see uh, that Take is taking some names. And, and how powerful that a god uh, can actually be without technically using their arcanum uh, with him just using his natural martial arts abilities and then during this entire time with the board game preparation i'm i'm just going like where where, where is ryu <laughs> why is she not here yet this is so strange that she's not here uh and then we have uh cassandra have her vision of like this field of twilight uh obvious references to the freya familia members and then this wind that's blowing which is obviously a reference to ryu and, and this whole thing was just kind of strange to me uh, because it's not exactly a surprise that Ryu is going to show up eventually. So, And this is a very straightforward vision. So it, it kind of feels like it wasn't even needed to be said. Like, of course, Ryu is going to appear eventually. It's just very strange that it takes to like the halfway point in the novel uh, to finally see Ryu. From the moment the war game starts until that turning point where Ryu finally shows herself it's almost kind of a like a drag like it, it kind of takes a bit too long to get to that point because that entire time uh the coalition is just kind of getting stomped on uh bell included with his uh <laughs> with him trying to fight otaro uh with level five strength like it, it, it was kind of a rough 
and the slow painful read to get to that point and in some aspects it does make sense because of course this is freya familia we're talking about they have a bunch of level fives and then the course culminating in those level sixes and the one level seven with Tarl. of course it makes sense that a coalition made up of like their strongest people being bell and subaki both of them being level five it makes sense that they would be getting curb stomped but it kind of feels like it was kind of unnecessary to maybe structure it this way with like the reveal of Ryu and the other waitresses and Mia coming in towards the middle of the novel like I don't know like it, it's kind of exciting in the sense that they kind of like come out of nowhere but at the same time like it wasn't even realistic <laughs> to even attempt this war game without those power plays uh, in, in people being Mia and Ryu it's it's just just kind of strange and the thing that was really strange to me was the entire time it's like they were trying to hide the fact that Ryu was going to eventually come because uh during like all of Lily's thought processes it's like but Ryu was not in their thoughts at all like I doubt they would have known that Ryu was going to come back a level six after a double level up but it, again very strange that they're just like hiding the fact that they, they know Ryu is going to come and help them right right and during this initial fighting, I was very worried uh, when Wealth got taken out by Alan really quickly because I'm like, well, is is that is that going to be it for Wealth? Like his his contribution was just making a bunch of magic swords, and, and the assault ended up not really amounting to much because everyone got healed by Heath and the healers, and it, it's like the magic swords meant nothing. Though it, does, it did give uh, some cool scenes when Naz was actually firing off magic swords with her bow. That was a really cool thing to see. Like, Naza definitely had her time to shine in this novel. But again, really worried that Welf wasn't really going to do anything. But then uh, he did get his moment at the end of the novel. So I was happy about that. Though there are two characters in particular that really did draw the short end of the stick. And that's Chikisa and Oka. From what I remember, they really didn't get to do anything, unfortunately. Unfortunately, like Oka got his time to shine in volume 14 when he severed the Emphis Bina head. But man, <laughs> they got curb stomped on. And and the rest of the expedition crew uh, from that arc, really all of them really got their moments to shine. Like Daphne and Cassandra, they got to wear Hegni down uh, where Cassandra or not, Cassandra's healing Daph while Daph is using her cool magic that like makes her skin turn to bark to, to hold off Hegni and make him use his curse weapon, which drains his stamina. And that ends up being helpful for a use fight later. And then uh, of course, Aisha uh, gets her time to shine against the Bringar. Mikito as well. Haruhime, of course, very important factor with her level boost. Lily, of course, the commander just so uh, Oka and the Shigase got the short end of the stick there. And, and uh, but speaking of the short end of the stick, uh, there's, Mord, uh, really fun to see Mord scenes because he's just like this goofy dude, <laughs> goofy middle-aged dude that has taken a liking to Bell and he won't admit it. And uh, we also have Dormal and Lewis's groups uh, that were saved by Bell uh, during volume 12. So cool to see them try to repay the favor by joining his coalition and convincing their gods to, to let them in. But uh, again, they got the short end of the stick as well, where they're trying to take out the healers and they just get absolutely destroyed. Uh, though we do get to see a cool scene with Heath and her auto-generating skill. And then that cool illustration as well. And with that, it's pretty much revealed that she's like the second best healer in Arario, the top one being Amid. But Heath does have her own strengths uh, with her being level 4 and actually being able to be somewhat decent in combat. So... That's heat side uh, again. Cool illustration. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be fun to see animated uh, for for reasons. Once again, Subaki was an important character towards the beginning of this war game because again, she is one of two level five characters that are parts of the group, and she gets to fight against Hegni, so that was pretty cool. And one thing that was strange was in the novel, it said that they had. Like they grouped Aisha together with Subaki and called both of them level five when the Aisha is definitely not level five. That's definitely a mistranslation because Aisha is most definitely level four because she just got level four after volume seven. And we know the typical, like the fastest rate that someone uh, except Pell uh, can get to like a, a new level 
is one year because the previous record holder was eyes who got to uh, who got level up in a year so it definitely has not been a year <laughs> since Aisha got to level four because it hasn't even been a year since Bell has become an adventurer. So again, mistranslation, like typos and stuff, I don't mind that because like you can obviously see what's going on there. Uh, but with a mistranslation uh, where like you say people's levels or skills wrong, that kind of bothers me because that's like literally misinformation. And while all that fighting is happening, we have Bell going off on his own to uh, go to Freya Familia's base while Everyone else is a decoy. Uh, he meets Van, and uh, he quickly makes quick work of Van. Unfortunately for him, uh, for Van, because he's level four, Bell now being level five wipes the floor with him, even while Bell is trying to keep up his charge. And of course, Bell runs into the warlord Otaro, the strongest. And really cool of Otaro to give Bell a free hit, because we got to see what, like, Bell was only level 5, he's not even level boosted at this point, which was kind of strange to me, but maybe it makes sense in the fact that how did he make level boost only last about 20 minutes, and they probably weren't sure how long it was going to take uh, for Bell to get to where he was, and they probably weren't predicting Otaro to, to meet up with him. Probably. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, level 5 Bell versus level 7 Otaro. Otaro lets him get that free hit, that full charge Argo Vesta. Otaro uses his own magic, kill this Vinny, and they, the attacks cancel each other out. So, like, kind of unfortunate uh, in a sense, because that was, like, Bell's one-shot move. Like, that was, like, their only chance, basically, to to beat Otaro uh, with, without the factors of, like, uh, later on with uh, Hiden, uh, Mia, and Ryu joining in the fight. And that was a cool uh, group fight as well, but we'll get to that later. So, again, really cool that to see that that kind of worked in a sense. Like, that would have taken Otaro out if he couldn't cancel it. Uh, but, again, Otaro almost a level 8. Bell level 5. And a fully charged attack from Bell's Argo Vesta was able to cancel out that kind of attack. So, that's, like, cool information to know. Because later on, Bell can get a level boost and then that Blessing of Lightning... And that kind of evens up the playing field for a finisher move uh, from Bell. Uh, but other than that first attack, uh, Bell just gets gets wailed on. <laughs> gets wailed on. Uh, until eventually we get to that turning point uh, with Ryu. So now we'll just cover that turning point. Uh, when all hope really seems lost, Ryu swoops down. Uh, and uh, ironically, this is kind of a cool like poetry-esque moment where Ryu found her justice and that was hope and now she's bringing hope to everyone else uh, during that war game when she comes down and we get that fight against Hegni and the reveal that Ryu got that double level up and that was hype uh, I wish that was the way I got that reveal but unfortunately that part of the story was spoiled uh, for me I already knew that Ryu uh, was getting a double level up because I think someone like asked me a question wondering if a, a picture was real. It was a picture of Ryu's status sheet uh, where uh, she's level six. I'm like, gosh, dang it. I, I didn't want to see that. Uh, but in some ways, it's not necessarily a surprise because uh, I've mentioned this before, uh, but this has kind of been something that's been building ever since like volume six. Because uh, in Volume 6 of the Light Novel, when Lily, Welf, and Belle are celebrating Welf's level up, uh, Lily mentions that during the fight against the Black Goliath, it was likely that Ryu got most of the Excelia from the fight, because she's the one that was fighting it the longest, basically tanking the Black Goliath uh, so Belle could recover and finish it off. That's not something you would like write into the story and point out unless it was going to be relevant for later. And it, it's been 12 novels later. We, we got the relevance. <laughs> it, it's, it's coming through now. So after all of Ryu's experiences the past five years, like, because again, it's not normal for an adventurer to wait five years before getting a status update. But that is indeed what happened. <laughs> like surviving the first encounter with the Juggernaut, uh, the Black Goliath fight, helping out in the war game against Apollo Familia, uh, tem fighting uh, Asterius for maybe like a minute <laughs> or 30 seconds uh, in volume 10 on floor 18, uh, fighting against eyes during the Zenos arc, and of course everything culminating uh, with Ryu's own arc and when she kind of almost kind of solos the Lambton, and then of course the fight against the Juggernaut itself and overcoming her trauma, all those experiences, the past five years, 
culminates into a double level up and not just that a really cool new magic ability astraya record amore sensei you sly fox out there calling it astraya record the, the the same title as that story from the third anniversary event in the mobile game and which also got a light novel adaption and the first of those novels releases in english uh, next month in february a kind of a cool advertisement in a way because uh, Ryu using Astraea Record or New Magic, and then a book called Astraea Record coming out the next month. Kind of, kind of a cool marketing tactic, which it technically isn't a marketing tactic. It's just a really cool coincidence. But Astraea Record, a really cool magic that lets her access to magic of her fallen familia members from Astraea Familia, and I believe she uses three magics here. And even though there's ten members, it, those members could have more than one magic ability. So it'll be really cool to see what. Uh, Ryu draws out of the hat uh, at other given points uh, in future uh, points in the story. Uh, but when she uses Elise's magic, that's such a cool moment. It'll be really cool to see that animated because everyone kind of notices this. Like, whoa, wait, that's Elise's magic. This is this is Estrella Familia. This is this is Gale Wynn. This is Leon. And I wish we got a bit more commentary on the fact that Ryu has revealed herself because it really does seem like she she's not really hiding who she is anymore, which is really cool. And and again, now that she's level six, she's one of the top adventurers in Rario, so she's probably going to be important for any future conflicts that happen in the story. Uh, but going going back to the fight, it's really cool that uh, Hegni kind of like sees Elise uh, behind Ryu as she's using Elise's magic, and it's revealed that Hegni actually kind of respected Elise. A lot of people respected Elise. Such a cool moment. <laughs> me, me being the Ryu fan just talking about Ryu and what's supposed to be the Freya arc. But this, this is a really cool moment, guys. Like, without Ryu showing up, they, like, they're all screwed. Uh, so Also, like, the quote that Ryu has before she fights Hegni is, like, she calls him comrade and asks if, if he's ready. And, like, like, ready for what? Ready to be cut down. <laughs> Damn. Ryu's awesome. <laughs> And she has also like taken out all the healers uh, so she can actually fight Hegni one on one. That was cool. And she eventually does best Hegni. And part of the reason for that and why she's able to do it quickly uh, is because Hegni was worn down from all his fighting and the curse weapon taking a toll on him. Uh, thanks to Cassandra and Daphne, uh, especially. So cool that. Uh, they actually had a factor in this fight. And also Ryu has a new sword. Kinda, because it's, it's made from fragments from a broken sword, Alves uh, Lumina. And now we have Alves uh, is, is Sitia. I believe it's actually supposed to be Just Sitia, because Just Sitia is the name of the theme song from the Estrella Record event. Uh, but after looking it up, it does seem like those two different spellings, the I and the J spellings, are both valid. Though it would have been nice if Yen Press used the J spelling so it matched up with the other translated material but this is yen press we're talking about uh the same people that had kept ryu's name uh, with the l spelling even though the anime and the games and even the official japanese romanization uses the r spelling for ryu so it, it <laughs> what do i expect <laughs> anyway uh we get to hedon turning coat when uh the other healers try to get up and uh heal Hegni and everyone else. Hedon turns coat and uses his magic on everybody. So I guess uh, Bell was right on his feeling about Hedon. And it's it's in character because while reading through like volume 16 and 17, it really did seem like Hedon, like, <laughs> it, I wouldn't call most of the Freya familiar members sane, but some seem saner than others. And Hedon is one of those people. <laughs> It made sense for Heaton to turn coat here, and I love his back talk to Heath. He's like, "Yo, I did not miss. <laughs> like, where are you? Where are you firing at, Heaton? I did not miss. I meant to hit who I hit, <laughs> and that was you." And then him like saying, "Yo, I have more mind than you, so even your auto regeneration, even if you have that, it's not going to help you. I'm going to win in the end." So yeah, Heaton turning coat. Uh, the, the awkward moment that Ryu had so when she's like, "Are we?" Are we good? Okay. <laughs> Tells her to uh, go help Bell, and he definitely needs to help. And I really liked how they like brought attention to how Heaton like he's he's turning coat on the familia 
for Freya because he believes this is the best for Freya to for Freya to be saved uh, from the state of mind that she is currently in and how he's basically embracing the role of a heretic very much in the same way that Bell was embracing the he the heretic role during the Zenos arc so kind of a a cool uh, back and forth there between like Bell and Heden encompassing like how sometimes the heroic thing to do is to be a heretic. So I thought that was a cool, neat detail as well. So besides Ryu, we also had the waitresses coming in and uh, that flashback between Anya and Bet is hilarious because uh, just just the thought of those two characters interacting is hilarious. And uh, Bet, Bet doesn't really like that he's being compared to Alan <laughs> as, as per usual. But we have Mia and Ryu joining the scene to help Bell against Otaro. Cool moment uh, when Mia shows up in her regular <laughs> apron wear and a shovel. A shovel. <laughs> Very in character for Mia to show up with just some outlandish stuff. <laughs> Jeez. And Mia is holding back Otara with a shovel <laughs> while uh, Ryu tends to Bell. And not only does Mia try to hold back Otara with a shovel, she calls him Boyo. <laughs> Mia's incredible. Just simply incredible, really. And we have Ganesha Familia just kind of confused about the situation. And uh, I was too, because I'm like, is not is this not like against the rules? Like what's what's going on? Like, were you still in Estrella Familia? And uh, I don't see Estrella uh, part of the coalition. And uh, because I originally thought that uh, like Ryu was going to go to Estrella, get her status updated, and then get her like status unlocked. For conversion so she could be part of Hestia Familia but that didn't happen and that still might not happen actually she might just still stay Estrella Familia because I'm I'm not sure how her magic would work uh, Estrella record if, if she were to convert I, I assume it would probably stay the same because I I think it just Estrella record only applies to the past Familia members not her current ones and it was cool like when Estrella actually comes strolling in like yo uh, I'm here to help and uh <laughs> I guess put slap a flower on me and technically we're legal. <laughs> the same thing with Demeter and, and Najord. Uh, but yeah, Estrella, Demeter, and Najord coming in because uh, they are necessary for the matrices and Ryu to actually join in the fight. And we do see one of the new um, Estrella Familia members in Cecile. I assume we'll learn more about her in episode Ryu Volume 2. Again, very excited for whenever that comes out but again we got a huge backlog before we can get to that novel but i want to see that novel because i love ryu and speaking of loving ryu uh omori sensei loves to just bring on the teases and then drop a bomb an absolute bomb so while ryu is tending to bell like their faces it's like this trap their faces are so close to each other as ryu is trying to like affirm uh bell's resolve uh, their faces are so close to each other that their lips are almost touching. Like, okay. Oh, all right, Amori Sensei. Enough with the teasing. And then the bomb drops. <laughs> he has Ryu confess to Bell right there. And, and Ryu, like, made it clear. Like, I love you as a man. <laughs> so you can't be confused. <laughs> and then Bell, I uh, like that he turns red. And like, oh, he's conscious of this right now. Uh, but th this is obviously something that will be resolved later. Uh, a very <laughs> Ryu way of confessing. Uh, very interesting because like Ryu's gone through a lot of stuff like in the past month or so. Like getting past her trauma and then finally reuniting with Estrella. And uh, I guess she wants no doubts in her mind. And she's also just going to get this out of the way and confess to Belle. <laughs> what a bombshell to drop. Uh, especially when this novel is supposed to be about Freya and all you got me thinking about is Ryu. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm very uh, interested to see how that develops uh, because, of course, that's unresolved at the end of this novel because the thing that needs to be resolved uh, was Freya's stuff. So we got the battle against the Bringar between the waitresses and uh, Aisha and other folks as well that are part of the main group. And I do like all these individual fights. Uh, Anya's magic is hilarious. <laughs> A freaking scream and everyone's like, yo, 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 yo. Like Freya Familia knows what's up and like, oh crap. And then uh, thankfully uh, we got those Ospi made earrings uh, to, to earplug. But man, uh, basically a level down debuff to even the playing field. 
And I, I really do like the tactics that were used in the fights against the Rengar because they got Lily throwing down the smoke bombs. We got Mikito's gravity field to separate the, the brothers. And then they all have their individual one-on-one -on -one fights. You got Chloe got the shine, Lunar got the shine. And then Naza and Mikito's teamwork was a really cool thing to see how Naza blocks uh, the move with her arm and how she has her own, de her own debuff. So we're stacking debuffs truly like a video game now uh, so a, a level a level boosted level three now mikito can use her move uh to finish off one of the brothers so yeah i, I do like how, how all those individual fights happened and how they played out uh, i was kind of worried for the alfric fight because he's supposed to be like the leader uh, of the brothers and all I surely does is use Helkaios, and that's something we've seen before. So I was initially a bit disappointed with that fight, and then uh, Alfred kind of comes back and uses his brother's weapons and kind of tanks everyone after that. So th thankfully, Alfred got his time to shine. It wasn't just <laughs> bulldozed over by a Helkaios, because that would have been disappointing. And of course, we have Alan coming in for that like inevitable match against his sister. Alan got the debuff and Anya got the level boost. So it was cool seeing them kind of be on level playing field. But uh, later on, it's revealed that Alan is, of course, holding back uh, because uh, to the surprise of absolutely nobody, <laughs> Alan does care about his sister. Uh, even Bet like hated to admit like, yeah, this guy's a bit like me. So I imagine he's really bad at expressing his feelings. <laughs> yeah. Like more, if you're worse at expressing your feelings than Bet, you got some problems, <laughs> and Alan definitely has some problems. Uh, but of course, we knew that Alan did care about his sister, and the the idea was he was just pushing her away because he wants her to be safe. One detail that is like constantly mentioned in this novel, like you have it with Royman uh, when he was talking to Finn, you have here with Alan uh, mentionings of the Black Dragon and. Uh, it's been a while since I've read Freya, uh, episode Freya from Familiar Chronicle, because uh, a lot of the backstories of the Freya family members are in there. You got some mini backstories uh, in this novel, uh, probably for people that have not read uh, episode Freya, just to make sure they have some reference points for the, uh, the Freya family members. Uh, but he mentions a dragon destroying their home, and I'm like, the only time you you hear a dragon like really mentioned in Damachi is when it relates to the black dragon. So I like how we're like getting some more focus on the black dragon because that supposedly that should be the end game of like the Damachi story, or at least the main story. Like the end game supposedly is the black dragon. So cool to see it getting some more focus because uh, with Freya's arc done here, I imagine that we are. We are now like building steps towards that with all the stuff that's happening. And then we also have Heaton convincing Hegney to turn sides as well. Because like, you know, Hegney's also kind of a cool dude, uh, despite him being very Chuni, uh, Chunibio Chuni. Uh, he is <laughs> a funny character and uh, he has the same kind of uh, heart as Heaton, it seems. So him turning coat, helping fight against Alan. Uh, but of course, you have Alan use his magic for like the first time that he didn't want people to see. Uh, but he basically turns into a chariot and raffle stomps everybody in the area uh, with his speed. And the other thing that happened during all of this is that uh, Hestia made her way uh, to the main group. And Lily basically told her and Haruhime to get to Bell because, yeah, Be Bell and uh, <laughs> friends are going to need help against Otaro. And they need that level boost. And uh, Haruhime had a funny line here. Because she's obviously like super exhausted and Hestia is like wondering if she's going to be good because Haruhime eventually tries to carry Hestia and Haruhime, I didn't know she had it in her, but she has the savage line that she can carry a pair of breasts <laughs> being level two. Like Haruhime has just <laughs> called Hestia a pair of breasts. <laughs> Incredible. So let's get into basically what is the highlight of the novel. This, this group fight with Ryu. Mia and Belle against Otaro. And Otaro, he's like not even moving. <laughs> His absolute defense is at work here and it, it's incredible. And then he eventually uses his Hilda's Vinny and his slashes are like eliminating entire areas. <laughs> Bell tries to save Mia and then Ryu saves both of them. And then you have Heaton come through in the clutch and uh, he deflects 
a, uh, one of Ataru's slashes with magic, and that was incredible. And then we have the four of them versus Otaro. And th this was also... God, dude, like, this, seeing this animated is going to be something, because you have the four of them attacking together. Heaton is, like, setting up, like, over 900 lightning bolts throughout the area. Like, I I feel sorry for uh, the people that had to animate this, because this is going to be a spectacle whenever it happens. But just seeing that coordination with Heaton, like, attacking Otaro from, like, blind spots, so Otaro is forced to block them while the others try to attack Otaro. Like, just really cool coordination, a really cool fight concept and how that works. So eventually Haruhime makes her way over and they get level boost to Hiden, Ryu, and Mia so they can be boosted to seven while Otaro is, is effing nuts and is in his like beast form. So Otaro is pretty much level eight at this point. And uh, Hestia is there to update Bell status. Uh, Bell gets his level boost and then, uh, man, dude, Hiden, I feel I felt so bad for Heaton <laughs> during this fight against the Tarl because Heaton like gets targeted instantly and he gets wha wailed on. Like it mentions that Otaro like punches his face and pushes his his glasses breaking it push into his face. Like man, that's gonna be gonna be rough seeing that battle damage in the anime. <laughs> and then before Otaro practically kills Heaton, Bell rushes in to save him. And that is when Bell gets that blessing of lightning from Heaton, like a magic that Heaton can't use on himself. Uh, but it's like Bell getting another level up almost. So Bell at level six strength with the blessing of lightning, and it's making like everything about Bell faster and infusing his attacks with lightning, like he can perceive things faster. And then you get to see uh, his rapid attack, rapid strikes, rapid attack skill uh, at work because he does like with the twin lightning swords doing 44 consecutive attacks in one second like i want to see that animated because that's, that's gonna look nuts and the lightning imagery is really cool when you consider bell's relationship with zeus because zeus god of lightning like yeah makes a lot of sense and i believe argonaut uh used a, a lightning uh weapon against the minotaur and the argonaut story as well so again very fitting and the one thing that's really interesting to me and i'm very curious about is that like, they said that Bell had the same feeling as when he was fighting the Minotaur and Asterius, and that kind of makes sense because you remember that Otaro was the one that trained the Minotaur, and then we know that uh, the Minotaur reincarnated into Asterius, so that makes sense. Uh, but it makes you wonder if what Amori Sensei was trying to uh, communicate was that Bell forced the uh, Bell's Ox Slayer ability to activate uh, because he thought of Asterius. Like, I, I wonder if that's what he was going for, because that was very interesting. Like, uh, yeah, uh, I kind of feel like Otaro's a Minotaur right now, so I get my stat increase. <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was a interesting thing uh, to, to mention during that fight. And then we had that final sequence, and it's so, so incredibly cool. So, Bell, like, faking, uh, telegraphing his move with his right hand, and Ryu's like, oh no. And then we had that flashback with Van, how he gave Bell advice and how he could use that weakness uh, to fake people out, which is what happened here with Otaro. Otaro takes the bait. Bell does a little sliding kick to knock Otaro down. And then we have Mia launch him up. Ryu used Luminous Wind to bombard him with magic. And then it, it culminates into that Argonaut charge. <laughs> of course, Bell's like, I need no weapon. <laughs> Firebolt punch. And that's the thing that, that wears the Taro down. Like we, you have that moment where the dust settles and the Taro is still standing. He gets to the center of the stage. Everyone's like, oh, are you serious? We got nothing left, man. And Taro's like, all right. I'm, I'm, <laughs> kneels down. And I love Mia's reaction. Like she's trying to be calm. He's like, oh, yo, Taro, we, uh, we good? <laughs> We, we good? Because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we got any more in us. So I was like, I'll give you five minutes. <laughs> like, thanks, man. Very, very generous. Very generous. Thanks, Ataro. And Bell is the only person that can move. So uh, I bet uh, no one predicted that the very end of this novel, like the, the final result would end in a foot race <laughs> with Alan, who 
finally appears in the chase to Bell. At first during this race, I was kind of confused the moment when Alan is about to catch up and then Bell starts to make distance. And then I, I remembered that when Bell got his level four level up, he got the escape skill. And I'm like, is that it? Is that, is that, is that escape activating? And then in the afterward, Omori Sensei said, good thing that Bell had escaped. Like, yo, that's what it was. Okay, cool. So I got that right, but before Amori Sensei revealed it to me. Cool. And uh, of course, I said before that Wealth, uh, I was worried that he was just going to be destroyed by Alan and, and then nothing else happened. But then uh, you see that scene with Lily, like calling out for help. And you're like, okay, well, th this is going to be Wealth, right? It's going to be Wealth. And then Lily's magic allows her to telepathically communicate with other Hestia familiar members. Welf got the memo and he, he crawls his way, <laughs> crawls his way to where Alan eventually shows up. Alan tries to reactivate his magic and then Welf uh, turns Alan and all the other magic users in the area into bombs. <laughs> they blow up and Bell is free to talk to Freya. And there we have the final confrontation where it is kind of a tragic tale for Freya because because she is the goddess of love. Like, is is any of this love around me like truly real? Like, people just just love me. Like, I don't know what it's like to fall in love, and that's where Belle comes in, of course. Uh, but unfortunately for Freya, the one person that could have potentially fallen in love with her in turn is a person that that does not love her in that way. So. Bell given uh, Freya her first heartbreak. <laughs> he, he had to end her love. I don't want to talk about this too much because like I, we, we've been, it's it's been a while. It's been three novels of this, so it, it, in in some way like I like this arc overall, but in some ways it kind of felt like it was dragging on. At, at some point I was like let's let's get this over with so we can get to some other stuff. It, it's just unfortunate because I think. I wouldn't be as worn out by this if it didn't take two and a half years <laughs> to, to get through all this stuff. And even Amore Sensei was like apologizing that it, it took a while uh, for these novels to come out because even on a Japanese side, it took a while for this arc to conclude. So hopefully from here, uh, we get to some cool uh, and newer things uh, sooner and faster, especially with uh, his crazy like 13 novel releases and 13 consecutive months thing uh, out of the way now as well. That was nuts. You can feel bad for Freya, uh, but at the same time, yo, you 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 pulled a lot of crap, <laughs> a lot of crap. And uh, the punishment was for Freya to disband the Familia and for her to be exiled. And of course, uh, we have that scene with her talking with Mia. And I, I thought that was funny. Freya's like, man, how did that lose? And Mia's just like, yo, you, you pissed everyone off. <laughs> pissed everybody in the city off of course of course you'd lose and the one thing that's interesting about freya familia being disbanded is like yo, know, actually what happens with these members are they are they just like no uh familia association yeah, because they only had loyalty to freya like what's going to go on here of course that's an answer for future novels but it is interesting to think about like are they going to convert to a different familia i can't imagine them willingly doing that <laughs> Maybe Oranos is going to step in and get some more members for Fells. <laughs> Fells gets some company. I don't know. Uh, but of course, well, Mia kind of like offers like, yo, just stay as seer. Duh. Freya's like, no, I can't do that. Can't do that. Walks outside, sees Belle, and she's like, ah, oh, crap. Here we go again. <laughs> and Belle like leads her to Ryu and friends as well. They make a wall and they... Yeah, basically, they all want her to, to be Seer. Ryu d gets her slap in, of course. Everyone's like, whoa. Ryu's never been like this with Seer. Well, well Ryu got some stuff has happened. <laughs> some stuff has happened. But yeah, everyone wants her to remain as Seer. Uh, you have that little cool scene with Anya kind of embracing Seer. And, and Freya was kind of worried about that one because, like, it, it, it really looks bad with what happened with Anya. <laughs> really looks bad. Because, like, Anya being, like, kind of banished from the Familia. And then her finding out who Seer really is. Like, Anya was having bad day upon bad day. But uh, now, like, again, kind of interested to see uh, how the future Alan and Anya interactions work uh, with all this being over, too. 
And uh, man, I'll be honest, I kind of kind of cringe a little bit uh, when the bell was like, Seer, you're a bad girl and I'm going to keep watch over you. Like, what the heck's going on? But it was, it was actually a reference to a line that Seer said back in volume 16. And no wonder why I didn't remember it because it's from volume 16, like two and a half years ago. And I haven't really reread that novel. So <laughs> at first I was like, what the heck is this? What is he saying? <laughs> but yeah, just a reference, just a reference. Him giving uh, Seer the other half of that uh, accessory with the knight because I'm going to become, I can't be your odor, but I, I can be your knight, I guess. <laughs> and uh, Ryu with the glare, like, yeah, we, we, we have some things to go over in future novels with that. But yeah, that, that's basically the end of the novel. So we'll talk about the afterword a tiny bit. I mean, uh, Omori Sensei said when he was researching about the gods, when preparing to write Damachi, uh, Freya, he took a liking to. He, he imagined her in that field of flowers, and that's how we got the imagery here in the novel. And also, he called, he called the volumes 12 through 18 the fertility arc. I'm like, I'm pretty sure most people consider volumes 12 through 14 the expedition arc, 15 kind of being this in-between novel, and then 16 through 18 being the Freya arc, but go ahead and call it the fertility arc. So there's that. I guess the next novel, we know what the cover looks like. I think I talked about it before. I got a nice elf-looking person. <laughs> Resembles Aina, and that's all I'll say because I, I don't want to speculate upon that. I don't know any spoilers about 19, as I said before. And I want my experience with 19 to be pure. <laughs> uh, unlike what it was with this novel when I unfortunately discovered that Ryu got a double level up. Uh, that's unfortunate. But yeah, uh, apparently volume 19 is the school district arc. <laughs> which which uh, it seems kind of funny because like we have like these crazy arcs where intense battles are happening with the expedition arc and the Freya arc. And then the next one is school district time. <laughs> It, it seems kind of underwhelming uh, when you call it that, but we are we are down for like a more chill novel, I, I would think, after the Freya arc. It, it'd be nice to have a chill novel. Who knows? Maybe it transitions into something more dire later on. But I think he said the school district arc is one novel, I think. Is that what he said? But yeah, we are moving towards the end game. I would assume now, with the Freya arc out of the way. Like that was one of the things we needed to do, and that, that's checked off the list so black dragon uh we still need to get to the bottom of the dungeon we got the ice garden stuff with the uh, loki familia so i'm wondering uh if like the next sort of Toria novels are going to be about that and maybe at some point we have like these high level people and ryu and bell kind of join in on the fun another thing uh, i wanted to mention from the novel was that they said like uh, they're like speculating on like the who's going to be the new hero candidate and but besides belt they also mentioned ryu that was kind of cool like yeah she's cool <laughs> new level six coming to town with some crazy magic with a stray record also a hero candidate so again bell and ryu definitely going to be major players bell obviously he's the main character uh but ryu going to be a major player now being level six uh towards any big conflicts that are going to happen again uh something needs to happen in the series like we have the ice garden now we need to get to the bottom of the dungeon one of bell's goals is to defeat asterius and eventually make a way for the xenos to live uh, with humankind peacefully and of course the black dragon so we got a lot of uh, what freya arc is down but we still got a lot of stuff on the checklist i don't know how the school district arc is going to relate to all of this but we're just going to have to see so again curious and what your guys thoughts are on the novel itself what uh, what did i miss what did uh, you want to highlight go ahead and comment down below what are your speculations for the future remember just make sure your comments don't involve anything uh beyond the official translated novels as for future releases, the next release that is planned for Damachi is Australia Record Volume 1. That release is February 20th, and we also know the date for Volume 2. That's on May 21st. Beyond those two novels, as of the recording of this video, 
I don't think there's been any other announcements for release dates, so we don't know when Damachi Volume 19 releases. We don't know anything about Sword Oratoria 13 or 14. We don't know anything about the three short story compilations, though I would say those are probably the lowest in priority. And uh, there's the two Argonaut novels that adapt the Argonaut story from the mobile game. And then there is, of course, Familiar Chronicle Episode Review Volume 2. I would want that to have a high priority as well. So I, I would just... I would assume uh, after Australia record, because they seem to be getting those rolling after the three Australia record volumes are released, I would assume like the order of priority is probably main series 19, Sword of Toria 13, 14, episode review volume two, and then they can do however they want to do uh, Argonaut and the short story compilations. I would assume Argonaut would get the priority first uh because they did a stray record but yeah we got a lot of novels in the backlog and i don't know how quickly they're going to release but hopefully it's uh not, not another year and a half wait for the next main series novel in volume 19 that would be depressing uh with how long it's taken for the fray arc to conclude i'm just i'm just ready for the next step in the story guys i really am but yeah this was a very long video I i'm sure you guys are very confused by the production quality i uh, wanted to experiment with in this video uh i did have to re-record one part because uh my computer wanted to crap out on me uh with the audio recording that sucked but yeah guys again hope you enjoyed the review Leave your thoughts about the novel in the comments as always and look forward to the next release in February, that being Stray Record Volume 1. Uh, I said before I wasn't sure if I would review it. I probably am leaning towards yes because uh, before I was wondering if uh, I would because I technically covered the story when I was talking about the mobile game way back in the day. Uh, but there is some new stuff in there so might as well go ahead and talk about it once I'm done with it. Uh, but that's also around the time that uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth comes out. Uh, so that I got that going for me. I, <laughs> it shouldn't be as long as uh, this thick boy, though. So maybe it'll be easier to get that done in time. Again, thanks for watching the video. If you want to see more Don Machi content, please give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel to see more. Don't forget to follow me on my socials. And this is Lorne, your Guild Advisor, signing out. No!